But I think the United States here in, the, in this case uh, is being perceived as hypocritical because it, refu it, well, it claims it wants to support democracy in Libya, but it refuses to do that in Bahrain and it is you know, perceived as reluctant to do that in Yemen. And obviously in the Arab world, the U.S. is being perceived as, as pro-Israelis, will not pressure the government of Netanyahu to make peace, and vetoed a U.N. resolution to force the, the Israeli government to stop its building of illegal settlements. Uh, and, and this perception, the United States is not helping itself as to be perceived as pro-democratic, on the side of the people and against the dictators. It's not, this is not the message the Arab people are getting from the U.S. So besides the economic even costs... Even after the last couple of weeks of, even of, the last of couple being of supportive weeks, of change in these countries yes, and so on. Yes, because Yemen is in a, a whole upheaval and uprising in Yemen. The United States is being quiet. Bahrain is too. And let's not forget the United States is the biggest supporter of absolute monarchies who are given, in Saudi Arabia, given people a bribe, $93 billion dollar, the, the, king, the king of Saudi Arabia have announced that he will give the people in terms of jobs or, or donations or, or gifts, but no freedoms and no political reform, no economic reform per se. And yet the United States, because of its economic and political interest in the region, refuses to pressure those regimes to open up their countries, to let the people have a say-so, let the people choose who would like to be governed for the first time in their lives, for the first time since the construction of the Arab nation states as a system after the fall of the Ottoman Empire in 1917. You Professor, know. go ahead. I was just going to say, one of the things that hasn't been dealt with, and I find it sort of astonishing because much of our concerns have been from a national security perspective. And no one's pointed out that the youth in all of these revolutions are now feeling empowered. What turns someone into a suicide bomber or turns someone to Al-Qaeda is the complete lack of possibilities. And when you watched what happened in Egypt, in Tahrir Square, the youth themselves said, no, there are possibilities. And they were successful. So that inspires other youth. So what instead, to me, is so positive is this is really the belief in all of our ideals that we claim to espouse. And when they actually take us seriously, one would hope that we would support that. I would also contextualize it with at least the rhetoric about both Iraq and Afghanistan. So that on the one hand, even if they understand, yes, it's very neo-imperialist for the U.S. to be intervening in both of these countries, and, and everyone in the Arab world understands that. But there is some part of it where they're, they're catching on to this thing, but yeah, maybe they're going to have elections. Maybe people are going to have a say. And in the kingdoms, as you talked about, there's not even the possibility of that. So where you get suicide bombers, extremists, people attracted to al-Qaeda, where there's no possibility. And now I would argue, as the youth in the piece on immigration said, the youth in the Arab world believe, they actually believe that they can be the determinants of their own destiny. And we should be celebrating that as opposed to, again, resorting to military action and doing what sort of seems to be in the playbook for everyone in the Arab world, what the United States does. Oh, they only intervene when it's in their economic interest. And they're not going to do anything about Bahrain. They're not going to do anything about Yemen. They're not going to do anything about Syria, which, you know, overnight has engaged in killing 30 protesters well, in if, cold if, blood. And I think the counter argument that would come from the State Department, for example, would be yes, but, or if they would be this open or in, right. their, in their private <laughs> consultations. Yes, but uh, in Yemen, uh, you have a longtime autocrat, not exactly a, a great guy, but what replaces him might be even worse. Uh, yes, in Bahrain, you have a, a Sunni monarch uh, ruling a majority Shia uh, country, and if that regime is swept away, uh, perhaps an Iranian aligned um, like Iran. a regime takes its place uh, like Iraq, like, like Iran, Iran. But we, we uh, facilitated and that. yes, yes, yes we, we facilitated did. that, but maybe we don't want to do it again. But the problem that we face, I think, is that on the one hand, we're ignoring the question of the what we claim to have respect for other countries' sovereignty. You hear that rhetoric a lot. Mm -hmm. We want the Libyan people to be able to build their own country. Well. 
what they build, we may or may not like it. And frankly, it's not our call. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't get to say, or we let's say we shouldn't get to say, mm -hmm. what happens next. Yes, we have an interest in it, but that doesn't mean we get to determine it. And I think the same is true in Bahrain, in Yemen. We can't take the position that unless we know that what comes next is going to be our guys, right. the way these guys are our guys, we're, we're somehow not going to allow it. The complication that I think we're seeing in the region is this issue, and, and you touched on it, that the, the question of hope and possibilities, we, we don't see, except in some parts of Yemen, we don't see absolute poverty. I would disagree with you a little bit, Ali, about the economic situation for, for Libyans. The reality is but last year... But do you disagree year, that Libyans should be better off than they absolutely. are? Absolutely. But what I was going to say is that last year in the 2010 ratings of the United Nations, Libya was number one in the Human Development Index for all of Africa. Number one, by quite a high mm. margin. Now, of course, they should be. They have this huge pool of oil and a tiny little population. It would be a scandal if they, if they were not. But the reality is it's very much like Saddam Hussein's Iraq in the, in the 1970s and 80s. Despite enormous repression, they had the best medical care in the region. That's where the Saudis went for their most advanced you know, heart surgery or whatever. The most advanced education system, free Women's right rights. through university, housing allocations, all of that. The, the problem is, that, and we still see it today with all these US-backed regimes, people are well off in terms of their economic and social rights, but their political rights are non-existent. And we're telling people somehow, it's OK that you have to choose. You can have those, but you can't have those. In our country, it's ironic because we have, although they're flawed, we have political rights. We have elections. We have corporations with way too much power to make them legitimate in all ways. But we have the forms of democracy here. We don't have economic rights. You don't have in the United States the right to health care. You don't have the right to a job. You don't have the right to education beyond high school. So those contradictions come right home to us, too. Why should people have to choose which rights they have? The Universal Declaration of Rights says you have both.